Welcome back, guys. It's time for another lesson. This time it's Macroscopic Circuit Behavior, Matter and Interactions, Chapter 20. So let's go ahead and get started. The idea this week is to move into a macroscopic domain. So last week we worked on a microscopic level with internal currents and fields inside conductors in order to understand how circuits behaved. Now we're going to take a little bit more macroscopic point of view. We're going to move into a domain where we can work with quantities that are easily measurable in the laboratory, for example. So in order to do that, we're going to lump these things together into components that have uh, properties that we can easily, easily determine. So the capacitor is one thing. The resistor is another. We're going to talk about ideal and real batteries. The notion of schematic diagrams that make it easier to draw circuits and think about them. Techniques for solving circuit problems and uh, voltage and current meters, the idealization associated with those. Finally, we're going to deal with transients and steady state behavior. So let's go ahead and get started with the capacitor. There's a, a website called PHET. It's a website of the uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. And I want to show you a little demo. Okay, this is the uh, FET capacitor simulation, and uh, this is what it looks like when you first fire the thing up. You have a couple of knobs you can dial, the separation between the plates, the area of the plates, and there's a, if you click the dielectric tab, there's a dielectric you can slide in and out between the plates. So what I'm going to do is uh, first turn on the voltage, and actually you can see charges accumulating on the plates, but I don't see any electric field lines. So let's turn on the electric field lines so we can see those guys. And you can see that as you adjust the voltage, you can make it positive or negative. Um, you get an electric field between the plates. And the electric field times the separation is equal to the potential. So um, if I adjust the separation, you see the electric field actually has to go up in order to make the same voltage in a smaller distance. Now, that means if the electric field is proportional to the charge density on the plates, that means the charge has to go up or down depending on the separation. So I'm affecting the capacitance. The other thing I can do to affect the capacitance is to change the plate area. If I increase the plate area, I naturally have to increase the um, a charge on the plate, which increases the capacitance. And you'll notice the charge on the plate went up dramatically once we started to getting into the dielectric. The dielectric causes the charge density to increase uh, fairly drastically. And that's because of the polarization charges on the dielectric. Remember, the, uh, the net electric field is only a fraction of the electric field produced by the charge on the plates because the polarization charges uh, are opposite. So for example, let's, uh, here's something we can do with the software that we can't do in the laboratory, and that is to introduce an electric field meter I've got a field meter that measures the electric field, and it tells me the plate field, the dielectric field, and the sum of the two. The dielectric field is the field produced by the polarization charges on the dielectric. The, uh, the plate field, of course, is just the voltage divided by the separation. So uh, the separation here is 5 millimeters. The voltage, let's see if the software will let me see it. Uh, what do we got? And put a voltmeter. Let's put a voltmeter on the battery so we can read the voltage of the battery. Okay, it's 0 0.791 volts. Let's dial it up to a volt, maybe. There we go. It's about a volt. And we have a plate separation of 5 millimeters. So that's 5 thousandths. So that's going to be something like 200 volts per meter. Sure enough, 200 volts per meter. But notice that in the, uh, in the dielectric, <clears throat> it's 1,000 volts per meter. It's five times greater. And uh, that's because the dielectric, the, volt, the electric field due to the dielectric charges is 800 volts per meter. <clears throat> and that leaves a net field of 200 volts per meter. So the net field in the dielectric and outside the dielectric is the same, 200 volts per meter. But in the dielectric, it takes a lot more plate charge to get that same voltage because for every for every volt you produce, 
from the plate charge, 8 tenths of the volt is canceled out by the dielectric material polarization field, and so the net field is only a fifth. That's where we get the dielectric constant of 5. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So here's the point. Uh, there are three things you can adjust. Plate separation, the plate area, there we go, and the voltage. I would encourage you to go in and play with this thing uh, just to get a sense of how it works and, and become familiar with the variables and how they relate to one another. That's, that's the main point. All right. So you see the idea is you have uh, the plates and the distance between the plates, the area of the plates can be adjusted, the voltage of the battery can be adjusted, and the uh, spacing between the plates can be adjusted. You can also throw in uh, a dielectric material. So we know that the electric field between the plates is the charge density divided by epsilon zero if it's a vacuum, and you simply doctor that up with the dielectric constant. Everywhere you see epsilon zero, you multiply by the dielectric constant, and that gives you the result in the case of an embedded dielectric material. The question is, how do I convert that into something that's useful on a macroscopic scale? The answer is, you integrate the electric field across the plates and determine the potential difference between the plates. So you integrate from the bottom to the top, minus E dot DL, and of course E is a constant. It's Q over A divided by kappa epsilon zero. Uh, so E comes outside of the integral. You just get E dot DL. Of course the integral of DL is just D, the distance between the plates. And so you get a simple result that the potential difference between the plates is the electric field times the distance between the plates. I want to solve that for the charge, and I get that the charge is equal to a bunch of junk times the voltage. Now the junk has to do with the properties of the capacitor itself, its area, the distance between the plates, the kind of plastic that's inside there. That all gets thrown into a lump called the capacitance, which uh, is often labeled C. So I'm going to Google some capacitor images here so you can see what those look like in practice. Okay, here I am Googling capacitor images. I'm sure you guys could do this too. But I just wanted to point out that capacitors in the real world come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. You've got your sort of ceramic disc capacitors here. You've got uh, dielectric uh, sort of cylindrical capacitors here. There's a image of a bunch of different little surface mount capacitors. And so they the point is they come in all different shapes and sizes. You can kind of get a sense of what they look like by going to Google and looking for images. But uh, that's the main point. So if you're curious, uh, go ahead and Google it. And if you want to, we'll actually play with some in the lab so you'll see how those will look. Okay, let's talk about a resistor. A resistor is just a conductor that has some free charge carriers that can drift around. The uh, electron current we talked about is the drift velocity times the number of carriers per unit volume times the cross-sectional area. Of course the drift velocity is proportional to the electric field strength and the proportionality constant is the mobility. So I can also write this as ANU times the electric field. If I want to know the conventional current I furthermore multiply that by the charge on one charge carrier and I get QNU times the cross-sectional area times the electric field. Now that product, Q and U, happens so often, we give it a name. We've already been introduced to it last time. It's called the conductivity sigma. So you can see that the electric field is like the current divided by the cross-sectional area divided by sigma. Again, if I want to write this in terms of a macroscopic number that I can measure in the laboratory, that would be the potential. So again, I'm going to uh, integrate this across or uh, along the length of the wire and uh, I'm going to get that the again the electric field inside the conductor is is constant in magnitude and it always points on the direction of, of uh, motion of the charge carriers so what that means is I can go from one end of the wire to the other and integrate e dot dl calculate the voltage along the length of the wire as long as the wire has a uniform cross section and a uniform conductivity uh, I get a simple result. It's just the electric field times the distance. That's the current times the distance divided by the cross-sectional area times the conductivity. That's the potential. But uh, 
we want to simplify that. I don't want to have to always think about the length of the wire or the length of the resistor and the conductivity of the material and the cross-sectional area. We are going to lump that all together into a single value called the resistance. So the new rule, it's the same rule, but it's the new name for the old rule, is Ohm's law. It's that the voltage drop across a conducting material is the current flowing through the material times the resistance of the material. That's the idea. So there we have it, two things, capacitors and resistors. We also are going to be dealing a lot with batteries. Uh, and I want to introduce the notion of an ideal battery. An ideal battery is a battery whose voltage doesn't depend on the current that flows through it. So the idea is, if I have a 9 volt battery, for example, and I dial up the current, I can dial the current to whatever I want, and the voltage remains exactly constant, 9 volts. Now in practice, uh, that's hard to achieve in a real battery. It turns out if you use a real battery, as you increase the current, the voltage tends to drop, and that's because of internal resistance. At least that's how we're going to characterize it. We're going to say that the battery has an effective internal resistance that behaves in such a way that as you draw more current from the real battery, the voltage drops off. Now, if the current you draw is small enough, you can approximate a real battery as an ideal battery, and that's what we're going to do most of the time. We'll be treating uh, real batteries is ideal, which is a pretty good approximation as long as the amount of current you're drawing is not very large. So, that's the idea. The next thing I want to discuss is the idea of schematic diagrams. You see a lot of pictures in the book that look like this picture here on the left. That's beautiful. It's lovely. It's gorgeous, but it's hard to draw. So, not being all artists, we like to draw pictures like this. So the idea is the battery becomes a series of alternating length lines with a label that tells you which is the plus and which is the minus. A capacitor becomes two parallel lines separated by a gap with a label that tells you how much capacitance. And the uh, resistor becomes kind of a zigzag line with a label that tells you how much resistance. Now uh, we uh, talked about the definition of capacitance is the proportionality constant between volts and charge. A farad is one volt per kilo. In other words, a farad is a unit of capacitance, and an ohm is one volt per amp. It is a unit of resistance. So those are definitions that we'll just get used to as we use them. Now, as we're solving circuits, we're going to be solving a lot of different kinds of circuits. There are two sort of, uh, how can I say it, yin and yang approaches to the problem. One approach is simple. Easy, but not very general. The idea is to simply combine elements and simplify a circuit over and over again until you have a trivial circuit. You solve the trivial circuit and then you kind of work backwards to get the currents and voltages in the, in the original circuit. The second approach is more algebraic. It's far more elegant. It's completely general, but some people don't like it as well because it is more algebraic. It's a little bit more abstract. So I'm going to introduce both of these guys and you can decide uh, when it's possible to simplify. I'm certainly open to you using that as a technique, but I want you to be aware that it's not always possible. So there we go. Um, we tend to use the first technique for quick and dirty answers to easy questions. We tend to use the second technique when the first one doesn't work, or always, depending on if you like it or not. So here's the idea. Um, let's say I present you with the following circuit. It's a battery with three resistors connected in the following way. And I ask you to solve for the currents and voltages in all the resistors. Now, the idea of this simplification technique is to notice that these two resistors on the right could be combined into a single effective resistance. In other words, if I replace those two resistors with a single resistor in such a way that the rest of the circuit wouldn't know that I had made the switch, how much resistance would I put there? That's the answer to the question that we're trying to ask. Now, in order to analyze that, we have to imagine there's some current flowing through resistor R1, down through resistor R2, and down through resistor R3. So the idea is, because we know about the node equation, or the node relationship, the current flowing into that node must be equal to the sum of the currents flowing out. So that means that I2 plus I3 must equal I1. Charge is conserved. Some of the charge goes down one branch, some of the charge goes in the other branch. So that's one thing. 
The other thing we know is that we can apply the loop rule, and I want to apply the loop rule to the little loop that includes those two guys. And so uh, I will label the potential drop across those two guys, and you can see that applying the loop rule simply means that if I go up through resistor R2 and then down through resistor R3, I must get back to zero, which means the voltage drop across resistor 2 and the voltage drop across resistor 3 have to be equal to each other. Okay, that's the idea. Now, in the equivalent circuit, I've got a current I1 flowing into the equivalent resistance, and the current must be equal to the voltage drop across the combined resistance R2 in parallel with 3, and um, it must be equal to V divided by whatever that voltage is. We're calling that voltage V2 or V3. They're the same voltage. Um, whatever that voltage is divided by the effective resistance must be equal to the sum of the currents through those two resistors. In other words, the current flowing into the junction has to equal the sum of the currents flowing through each of the resistors. The loop rule tells us that the voltage drop across those two resistors is the same. So that means I2 has to be V over R2. I3 has to be V over R3. And the sum of those two currents has to be equal to V, the same V, divided by the combined resistance in order to draw the same current. And uh, But notice that I've got a V on the left and a factor of V everywhere on the right. So I can factor all the Vs out. And you can see that I, what I really have to have is that 1 over the effective resistance is equal to the sum of the reciprocals of the two individual resistors. So this becomes a rule now. But there's nothing specific. I haven't given any numbers. This is all just very general. And so it turns out whenever you combine two resistors in this way so that they're connected at the end, the effective resistance of the two combined resistors can be gotten by applying this idea. Now, let's take that circuit and see if we can simplify it any more. The idea is that the current through the combined resistance is equal to the current through R1. Those two currents have to be the same. I also know that the voltage drop across those two guys <coughs> uh, must go in, uh, so the voltage has to go down as you go through R1 and down again as you go through R23. And uh, you can see that the currents have to be the same, so I can just call that I. And then I can write down the loop rule. The loop rule says that V0 minus IR1 minus IR23 equals zero. And notice I, I had my, uh, one of my equations didn't blend, fade in correctly. Oh well. Too late to fix that now. I'm just going to let it sit. I want you to notice that the I is common, so I can factor the I out. And uh, the product there, the multiple, the factor of I, is the effective resistance of those two resistors in series. So R1 and R23 act like a single effective resistance. I could draw the picture like this. Whose resistance is equal to the sum of the two resistors in series. So then the new rule is that if you have two resistors in series, they behave like a single resistance whose resistance is equal to the sum of the two. Right? That's what we just showed here. And uh, then we can solve for the current. The current is just going to be equal to the voltage of the battery divided by the effective resistance of all the resistors combined together. Okay? Now that was all kind of abstract. Let's, uh, let's try to work this out with some real numbers. Suppose I have a battery of 15 volts. Let's say R1 was 75 ohms, R2 is 100 ohms, and R3 is 300 ohms, just as an example. Let's solve for the effective combined resistance of R2 and R3 taken together. From our previous work, we realized that that's 1 divided by the sum of the reciprocals, and that turns out to be 75 ohms. So the combined resistance of R2 and R3 combined in parallel like this with their ends connected together is 75 ohms. So then I simplify the circuit to two 75 ohm resistors in series. That means the effective resistance of all three is the sum of the two, R1, plus the combined R2 in parallel with three resistance of 75 adds up to 150. So now the current is simply the voltage divided by the effective resistance. That's 15 divided by 150, so that's a tenth of an amp, or 100 milliamps. Now the question is, what's the voltage drop across R1? Well, I calculate that by taking the current through R1 times the resistance of R1. That gives me 7.5 volts. So we're getting a 7.5 drop across R1. That leaves 7.5 volts 
left to drop across R2 and R3. So V2 and V3 also have to be 7.5 volts. Once I know that, I can then solve for the current flowing through R2 and the current flowing through R3. R2 has to have 7.5 volts divided by 100 ohms, or 75 milliamps. I3 has to have 7.5 volts divided by 300 ohms, or 25 milliamps. Notice another way to get I3 would be simply to take the 100 milliamps flowing through R1 and subtracting the 75 milliamps flowing through R2. The balance has to be what's in R3. So there's another way to get the same answer. And uh, that's how that works. I want to point out one other thing is that you can also solve this. That's, so that's the simplify approach. Now the approach we're going to take next is the more abstract approach, and that is to simply apply the loop rule and the node rule enough times to get enough equations to solve the system of equations. So you define I1, I2, and I3, and the potential drops across the three resistors. And then you write down the node rule, which says that I2 is I1 minus I3. You write down the loop rule for loop 1, which says that you go up the battery, down R1, and down R2. Then you do the loop rule for the second loop, up R2 and down R3. Notice that uh, I picked the interior loops with no wires in crossing the loop internally. So I always choose loops that are simple, that don't have any internal wires. That turns out to always be good enough, and it always leads to the simplest equations. So I would recommend that. Uh, so I write down the loop rule, and I write it down again. The, this is loop rule for loop 1 and loop rule for loop 2, but I've written it down in terms of I1 and I3 only. In other words, I use the node rule to get rid of I2. So if you do that, you get these two equations. And now you can see, if I put in numbers, that uh, what I have is two equations and two unknowns. I can solve the bottom equation for I1 in terms of I3, plug that back into the top equation, and solve for I3. I get 15 volts divided by 600 ohms, or uh, 25 milliamps, same answer we got before. I multiply by 4, and I get I1. And of course, then I can take the difference to get I2. Uh, I want to point out one other thing, and that is, if you look at these two equations in two unknowns, and you've had some linear algebra, you can see right away that it's easy to write down a matrix for the resistances, and a vector for the currents, and a vector for the voltages, and then you can take, uh, you can use Kramer's rule to solve for the currents, or you can find the inverse, which is probably much harder. Um, Kramer's rule, you just get the determinant of the resistance matrix with and without the known voltage vector plugged into the two different columns, and uh, take ratios of determinants, and you get answers very quickly. So, uh, anyway. If you have a little linear algebra, you can use that technique and save yourself a bunch of time. If you haven't had linear algebra, you can always do two equations and two unknowns and get the right answer. So, all right. Now, let's talk about uh, volt and current meters. And then I have a couple of demos to show you, and that'll be it. So, again, let's say we have this circuit, and we want to actually build the circuit in the laboratory and make some measurements. Suppose we connect a voltmeter across R1 to measure the voltage. But then we realize, hey, wait a minute, the voltmeter has some effective resistance. And now I've got a parallel combination of the voltmeter resistance and R1. So I've actually modified my circuit by trying to make a measurement of voltage. But I want you to remember that the parallel combination of two resistances is equal to 1 over R, 1 over the first resistance plus 1 over the second resistance. If I want to have very little impact on the circuit, what I need to do is make the resistance of the voltmeter very, very large. Then when I take 1 over a very large resistance, it'll have very little effect. I could, it's practically negligible. And then the, the effective resistance will be very nearly equal to the resistance of the original resistor. On the other hand, if I wanted to measure the current in the branch that goes from the node down to R3, I want to insert a current meter. But then I realize, hey, wait a minute, a current meter also has some internal resistance. And the question is, isn't that going to affect the circuit? Well, yeah, it is. You're going to have to add the internal resistance of the amp meter to the resistance R3 to get the new resistance in that branch. But um, the point is, if I can make an amp meter with very little resistance, uh, 
then adding this tiny resistance to the resistance R3 will make a negligible difference to the resistance of the brain. And so that's the idea. When you have a voltmeter, you make the resistance large because you don't want the voltmeter to draw any current. That's one way to think about it. And you make ampmeter resistances very tiny because you don't want a voltage drop across your ampmeter because that will affect the circuit. That's the idea. One last thing, I want to talk about what happens when you combine capacitances. I want to show a little demo of that, and then I'll give you the answer. Okay, so here we are back at the uh, FET capacitor lab. Now we're on the multiple capacitors tab. And again, we can show electric field lines. Um, I'll turn on the voltage so you can see a couple of electric field lines. We can also adjust the capacitance here by uh, fiddling with the plate separation, essentially. But the other thing this one has is the ability to put two capacitors in series or three capacitors in series and then see what happens there. Let's, let's look at two capacitors in series. First of all, I want to notice that for a given voltage, if I've got two capacitors in series, the uh, voltage drop is shared between the two. So if this is a one volt drop, for example, the voltage drop here is going to be uh, a part of one volt and this will be the remainder. So let's say these are equal capacitances then you'll get half a volt here and a half a volt there. So, um, But the amount of charge you get is equal for the two capacitors because whatever charge accumulates on this plate you get the negative charge here, you get the same positive charge here and the same negative charge here. So the charges are going to be equal on the two capacitors. When the current flows, notice it flows the same to both capacitors, and so the charging rate is the same, and the total charge you end up with is the same on both capacitors. So uh, the effect of that is that the um, since the charge is the same, and the voltages add to a fixed voltage, if you work out the math, you'll find that the uh, capacitance of the combination is uh, I should say, the reciprocal of the capacitance of the combination is the sum of the reciprocals of the two capacitances. Also, if I put them in parallel, notice that now the currents add, the current coming out of the battery, some of it goes down this branch, some of it goes down that branch. So the currents add, the voltages are equal. Before, the voltages added to make the total voltage, and the currents were the same. Now the voltages are the same, because the, both capacitors are connected to the same battery, if I do a little loop rule here, I go up this voltage, excuse me, and down that voltage. They have to be equal voltages. But the currents are not equal. Um, if I make this capacitance bigger and that capacitance smaller, you'll notice that the charge that goes on this one is larger than the charge that goes on that one. That implies a greater current here, smaller current here. The capacitance of the two turns out to be, for the same voltage, the charge is the charge of this one plus the charge of that one. So that means that the capacitances add. So with two capacitors in parallel, the effective capacitance of the combination is the sum of the two capacitances. However, when they're in series, the, it's the reciprocal of the capacitance of the combination is equal to the sum of the reciprocals of the two capacitors. Okay, the answer is that when you have capacitances connected in parallel, the capacitances simply add. And when you have capacitances connected in series, then you take the sum of the reciprocals of the series capacitances, that's equal to the reciprocal of the effective combination of those capacitances. All right, so that wasn't too bad. Now let's talk about transients. So if I have a circuit where I close a switch or connect a circuit, uh, and that starts a capacitor charging or discharging or something along those lines, then um, that will produce what's called a transient. After a while, everything will settle down, and I'll be in a steady state constant situation. But in the meantime, I'm in a transient. So uh, we want to see how to do that. Turns out there's two rules that basically you need to follow. One is you can't change the charge on a capacitor instantaneously. It takes current and uh, the amount of time it re is required to charge a capacitor depends on the current that's permitted to flow. The more current that flows, the faster it charges. The less current that flows, the more slowly it charges. Okay, that's the idea. Um, also, if you want to send current through a resistance, by Ohm's law, that requires a voltage drop. The bigger the voltage drop you can have, the more current you'll get. And that's a simple enough idea.
if you were to connect a circuit like this at a time t equals zero, there's no charge on the capacitor. Um, so when the thing starts, the voltage drop across the capacitor is zero. Now it takes time to charge the capacitor, so there's a period of time during which the voltage drop on the capacitor is going to remain small, which means that the voltage drop is going to be mostly across the light bulb. As the light bulb, as the current flows, however, the capacitor will develop charge, it will get a voltage drop, and the voltage drop across the light bulb will diminish. As the voltage drop across the light bulb diminishes, the current flow will also diminish, which will reduce the rate at which the capacitor is charging. Here's the capacitor is getting a little bit more charged up, and notice the bulb is getting dimmer. The voltage drop across the bulb is less, and the current flow is less. The electric field in the wires is diminished. If you wait a long time, the capacitor will become fully charged. There will be no net field in the wires. There will be no current flowing. All the voltage will be dropping across the capacitor. No voltage will be dropping across the light bulb, and you will have reached steady state. Let's look at a demo of this idea. Okay, so this is a different FET simulation. It's called the AC and DC circuit construction kits. And this one is really cool because you can create circuits by dragging things around. So for example, I can take a battery here and uh, the blue dots are uh, electrons. So they're, I mean, they're sort of not really electrons. They're, they're pretending to be electrons. I can hook two batteries together. Um, let's take a light bulb, and how about a capacitor, right? So these things look a little bit like the things we've been dealing with. Let me go ahead and turn the light bulb on its side, and then we'll just hook some wires up here. Oh, actually, I want to do one other thing. I need some charts, so um, let me get a voltage chart. And what I can do is uh, actually hook this up to something. Let's see. Let's look at the uh, voltage across the lamp, for example. And now we're measuring the voltage across the lamp. Um, and we can do a current, let's see, current chart. And I can do this by... Uh, Oh, I can just point this. This is a magical current chart. I can just point it at something, and it tells me the current flowing there. So let's look at the current flowing into the capacitor, say. Now we know that the current flowing into the capacitor is going to be the same as the current flowing out and the current flowing through the lamp and everything else. But let's uh, now let's hook a wire to the capacitor. Hook a wire from the capacitor to the lamp. Hook a wire from the lamp to the battery. Now when I make this, complete this circuit, current is going to start to flow. And let me actually zoom in here a little bit so we can see the current. And uh, I'll zoom in here a little bit. Well, that's probably okay. All right. Let's look at, boom. Notice that the voltage drop across the bulb started out uh, let's pause it. Started out large and negative and eventually went to zero. The current started out large and positive and eventually went to zero. So that is uh, sort of what we expect for the transient behavior we were just talking about. Now if I disconnect the battery, let's go ahead and start the time up again. Let's disconnect the battery and uh, how do I want to do that? I'll just delete that wire and Leave this wire, and I'll just add a new wire. The capacitor's got a charge on it now, but if I hook it back up to the bulb, boom, we'll discharge the capacitor through the bulb, and notice the voltage across the bulb went up and then to zero, and the current went negative, so it was discharging this time. Anyway, that's the idea. Kind of a fun tool. I would recommend playing with this one as well to give yourself a sense of how these things work without having to get your hands dirty. Okay, now let's analyze this thing mathematically. Let's imagine we connect the circuit at t equals zero and allow the current to start flowing. I'm gonna write down the loop rule. There are the current in this circuit is the same everywhere because there are no branches. So I'll write down the loop rule. 
it says that the uh, voltage drop across the battery minus the voltage drop across the capacitor minus the voltage drop across the resistor has to be zero. So we'll put that down, V0 minus Vc minus Vr is equal to zero. But that's V0 minus the charge on the capacitor divided by the capacitance minus the current through the resistor times the resistance. Now, the thing is, um, if I take the time derivative of that equation and then solve for dv0 dt, I'm going to get 1 over c dq dt, notice c is a constant, I'm going to get plus r di dt. So i is changing in time and q is changing in time. But the point is, what is dq dt? The QDT is the rate of change of charge on the capacitor. But the rate at which the capacitor is charging is exactly equal to the rate at which charge is flowing through the wire, which is nothing other than the current. So DQDT is the current, right? DVDT, or dv naught dt of course, is zero. dv naught dt is zero, because v naught is a constant. It's the voltage of the battery. And finally, um, you know that uh, if I take the time derivative of uh, the equation, I get a dQ dt, but I also get a di dt. So I end up with the result that i is equal to minus rc di dt. I'd like you to if, stop the podcast if you have to, start with that top equation, and don't be happy until you can produce the equation there at the bottom. It's just a little algebra. If I put all the i's on one side of the equation and all the t's on the other side, I get this result. That di over i is dt over rc with a minus sign. What that means is um, i starts out big at the beginning and it diminishes with time. di is going to be an always negative. If, as time goes forward, the current goes down. So that's consistent with what we expect at t equals zero. Remember the capacitor is uncharged and all the voltage drops across the resistance. So at t equals zero, there's a big current. As time goes on, the current diminishes. So let's see if we can solve that. The plan is going to be to integrate both sides. Of course, the integral of di over i is the natural log. The integral of dt is just t. And so I get an equation relating the natural log of the ratio of the current to the initial current and the time. If I solve that for the final current, I get the answer that the current is equal to the initial current times an exponential that decays in time, just like we saw in the demo. Let's start with that and see if we can relate that to the charge. The charge is the integral of dq, but dq is the current times dt. Remember i is dq dt, so dq is i dt. So the integral of dq is nothing other than the integral of the current mm -hmm. times dt. So you integrate that, and you get the following result. The charge at any time is i naught rc times this 1 minus e to the minus t over rc. Um, then the question is, what is i naught? Well, at t equals 0, the voltage drop is entirely across the resistance. So that means I0 times R must be V0. So that means I0 must be V0 divided by R. In other words, the current acts like a short circuit, or the capacitor acts like a short circuit at the beginning, t equals zero. And so it just acts like a wire. And uh, what that means is the initial current is just the voltage dropping entirely across the resistor. I put that in, I notice the R's cancel. And I get the charge at any time is V0 times C times that exponential parenthetical thing. If I calculate the voltage at any time, I divide the charge by the capacitance, and I get the voltage is V0 times the parenthetical exponential thing. Now that parenthetical exponential thing is an increasing exponential. If I graph that, it looks like this. The voltage starts at zero. It grows exponentially until it finally reaches one, well, it reaches V0 only asymptotically. Okay, It reaches V0 asymptotically. The, uh, if it were to continue at the rate at which it starts out increasing, if it were to continue at that rate, it would end up uh, reaching the final voltage V0 in one RC time constant. R times C is sometimes called the time constant of the circuit,
It's the time it would take to charge if it kept charging at the same rate that it starts charging at. Of course, it doesn't. The charging rate diminishes as time goes on. And of course, if you discharge, you get the same basic idea. You get a drop in voltage on the capacitor. And if it started, if it continued at the same rate, if it continued at the rate at which it starts to drop, it would drop in one RC. But it takes longer than that because the rate diminishes as time goes on. So I'm going to show you a little demo now of charging and discharging and an analogy, an analog, an analogy that I've cooked up involving liquids. Okay, so. okay this is a uh, capacitor charging analog I've cooked up. Uh, you should imagine these. this is like a reservoir with liquid in it. Uh, notice it's full of water or something. Here's a little tube that connects these two different containers. And this is a finite size container into which water can flow. And the analog here is that the, the height of the fluid is a little bit like voltage. Or actually, I'd rather say the pressure at the bottom here is a little bit like voltage. And a pressure difference between the two ends of this skinny tube are going to act like the voltage drop across a resistor. If I have a pressure difference between the two ends of the tube, that means water is going to flow from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. Similarly, if you have a voltage drop across the ends of a conductor or a resistor, same idea, um, you'll get a current flow because that will imply an electric field in the conductor that pushes charges from one end to the other. As the current flows, of course, it's going to fill up this container, and as the height of this side increases, the pressure at the bottom will increase. But that will uh, uh, change the pressure difference between the two ends and diminish the flow. So that's kind of the way a capacitor charges. The other thing I should point out is this is an analog of a battery. No matter how much fluid we pull out, the height of the side is not going to change. So you should imagine it's attached to some kind of a uh, fluid source that replaces any fluid that's uh, taken out, and it also um, takes out any fluid that's put in to keep the height the same, and therefore keep the pressure at the bottom here the same. So let's start the thing and see how it goes. Notice as the fluid flows, the height here goes up. That increases the pressure at the bottom, which reduces the flow rate. So the flow rate is diminishing as, um, as time goes on. Eventually, it'll reach uh, equilibrium. You can see all these curves are asymptotically approaching equilibrium. The cyan here is the height of the water on the uh, left. The green is the height of the water on the right. And the magenta here is the difference in height between the two sides. So as the green approaches the cyan, the difference approaches zero. As the difference in height approaches zero, the flow rate approaches zero because it's the difference in height that produces the flow rate. All of these are exponential curves, and just to get a sense, let's, uh, let's look at how long it would take the water flow to reach zero if it continued dropping at the same rate it started. If I sort of trace this down, you'll notice it's going to be in the neighborhood of five or six. And same way with these guys. All of these exponential curves have the same time constant. So it looks like if I trace that down to where it would cross if it kept going at the same rate as it, as it started with, it would be five or six seconds. Okay. What I want to notice is what happens when I adjust the size of this second container. So let's do that and see what happens. Okay, so I'm just going to go in here. It turns out this is the code that does the um, display. I'm going to change the size of the right-hand reservoir to half of the size of the big guy. And let's go ahead and run that. And uh, get this out of the way. Notice now it's half the size. Let's go ahead and turn on the time. And I want you to notice that the time constant now, the time it takes to reach half its height, or the time it takes to reach equilibrium, if it continues at the initial same initial rate, is now about half of what it was before. So this thing is actually filling in half the time. If I uh, make it even smaller, let's take it down to a third of the size, run that, and turn on the time. Let's see, I gotta push a key, I guess, and notice that it fills even faster now. So now it's down to a third of the time it would take. So um, anyway, the point is the capacitance is like the um, cross-sectional area of this container. 
the bigger the cross-sectional area, the more liquid it takes to reach the same height. And height produces pressure, which is like voltage. So the area of this thing is similar to the area of the plates of the capacitor. And uh, anyway, some people appreciate a, an analog that they can relate to a little more directly. The other thing I'd like to do is to show what, what uh, discharging is like. So we can switch the thing around a little bit and change it to a discharging example. In, in this case, the, this thing starts out full and it pours into the reservoir, but the reservoir has no height and the water is removed as soon as it's added. So if I turn on the time here, you'll see it's exactly the opposite situation. Now the water flow is negative and the two, uh, the height of the right hand side is falling with time. The difference in height is negative. The left hand side has a height of zero. So this is analogous to the discharging case. So anyway, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. And that's it.